I see our clients going through who are in our Better Business, Better Life program as they work on getting their business into the right space where it's not about the revenue, it's about the profit. And it's mostly about creating more time for what matters most in our lives. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question. What has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling. I'm the business psychologist, the author of the Four Week Vacation and the How to Hire the Best series, as well as the founder of Tap the Potential, where we coach entrepreneurs like you to design sustainably profitable businesses that give you more time for what matters most and more money in your bank account than ever. Because after all, we believe work supports life, not the other way around. Weekly on the Profit by Design podcast, we bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. Profit Designers, the four-week vacation, the entrepreneur's ultimate guide to taking your life back from your business is now available. Go to fourweekvacation.com, grab a copy of the book, and be sure to follow the steps there to claim your bonuses. When you purchase the book, you are eligible to join me for my upcoming live training, the four-week vacation, better business, better life jumpstart. Plus, and you'll also get an invitation to an exclusive VIP closed door training with me to identify the true profit potential within your business. Just follow the steps at fourweekvacation.com. And I hope that the four week vacation book inspires you for what's possible. It's time to take your life back from your business. Welcome to the Profit by Design podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sabrina Starling. And today I'm joined with my good friend and colleague, John Bates. And John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Dr. Sabrina. I love time with you. Is time well spent. I appreciate every opportunity we get to spend together. So you have been on the podcast multiple times previously. So we might have some listeners and viewers who aren't familiar with you. So I want to share a little bit about... John, what John is really good at is bringing out the best in us to inspire others and to impact the world. And that's the best way I have to sum it up. But I have watched John take myself, who was a struggling speaker, and our clients and my colleagues in their work with you, John, I see, you know, when we are nervous and we don't know our message and we haven't practiced what we're going to say, all of that becomes static and it keeps us like playing small. And I've seen you in just giving feedback and the way you give feedback and the way you observe and you connect, you have just pulled us out of that and helped us to really show up in a powerful way. So that's your gift. And you're out there sharing it in the world. It comes from your own experiences, your own your own life experience. And it, we're here today to talk about the four-week vacation book launch, and you're featured in the four-week vacation. So much of your story is really part of the why of the book in terms of the impact that businesses can have on us. You have a very powerful life experience, and I would love for you to start off by sharing what's led you to do what you do. What's your why? Well, my why is to bring out what's awesome inside forward-thinking global leaders at any level in the organization, at any level in their life, so they can have the impact they want to have in the world. And, you know, I was, I mean, I guess my quick story is that I was always a chief evangelist for the various companies that I was a founder, a co-founder, or a very early stage employee at. Been on the internet doing things in the dot-com space since 1994, raised several hundred million dollars in Silicon Valley and beyond. Admittedly, never had a successful exit yet but I can raise it. So that's good. Uh, At least that, right? And 
I was always working with hard skills people. I was envious of them and felt like I wasn't as valuable as they were. And then I went to TED, saw the power of truly amazing public speaking, got very involved in the TED and TEDx community and had an epiphany when I saw this guy with all the hard skills just blow it on stage. Much What a drag. And then my friend said, we got to do something to help people like this. And Sabrina, I don't know why it took me so long. Like I had all the tools forever. But when he said that, I was like, oh my gosh, I could have had a V8 if I just got over myself. That's what it really took. Just getting over my own insecurity and realizing that if I stopped honoring the chip on my shoulder and actually started to just bring what I had to the people around me, I could make a total difference for people like that. People with the hard skills had so much education, so much to offer, such great ideas, but their communication wasn't a match for how great their ideas were. So they made less of a difference, you know, and that is heartbreaking to me. So I stepped in and based everything I did because of that moment in human evolutionary biology and human neurophysiology. In other words, the science of communicating with human beings and motivating and leading and changing the paths of their lives through communication. And so that's what I do now. And I feel like I found my icky guy, you know, my reason for being and what I'm supposed to do here on earth. And, you know, I guess a big part of why I can do that now is because I have so much failure and so much time in the woods that it taught me a lot, probably taught me a lot more than that much success would have taught me. And it gave me just an incredible, a really deep level of compassion, which I think is important in what I do. Absolutely. And I'll share with you, I had a conversation with Sir Stephen, our mutual friend just yesterday. And he commented that he has noticed in the last year or so that my message has gotten very clear. And I said, well, I've done a lot of work on that, Sir Stephen. And I want everyone to know, John has been a big piece of me doing a lot of work on that. I went through a cohort with you. I think it was this time last, well, yeah, because I did it on over the Christmas break is when we started this. That's right, yes. And you really, what you were having us do is to really dig deep and find our message and our story. And we shared it in this small cohort and we got lots of feedback and you gave us feedback, but we were, I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And I tell, I was just on stage Tuesday sharing my story that we worked on in the cohort. And I could see, by the way, that was my first live event, John, since we were together at the retreat in March, 2020, right before COVID. So I actually got to go on stage. I've got my first big one coming up here soon too. <laughs> it's really cool to be back with real people again in the room. <laughs> A little anxiety provoking, but also very exciting, right? Like it's weird. It's just kind of an interesting jumping back into life, right? So did Slim make it on stage with you, Sabrina? So I told the story of Slim and I Slim Starling. Slim Starling. So the story, just briefly, the story of my grandpa Slim is that he was a true entrepreneur. Like he was an oil man and he just chased growth and opportunity. And he had this brilliant idea to, and this was back in the 1950s, he was going to sell more fuel at his service station. And he put up a screen behind one of his service stations and decided to give purchasers of gas, five gallons of gas, a free ticket to the show. And the idea clicked, cars came in droves. Like this was a drive-in theater screen. This became a drive-in theater. And that's how he sold more fuel. And so the business took off. And you know, that's it, right? All of us want that wild success. We want to, you know, Mike Michalowicz talks about get different. Well, Slim got different. <laughs> he did something different and it took off. And we all want that wild success in our business, but that wild success comes with a significant impact on quality of life. And that's what I am so passionate about. I believe work should support life, not the other way around. Everyone in the family was impacted by that wild success in not such a great way. Everyone was working and it became all about the business. The whole family's life revolved around the business and they were eating their meals, you know, out of the concession stand. My dad as a child was eating hot dogs, popcorn, nachos and soda pop as a regular diet out of the concession stand. 
And that was just because he had to work and everybody had to work. And this is what I believe is so important for us as entrepreneurs to remember is we have to write our relationship with our businesses and not let the business take over our lives. And so you've had a very life-changing experience that really has, that kind of was like your big eye opener that the way I'm doing things as successful as these things are, it's not working. So would you be willing to share that with our audience here, John? Sure. This was the kind of, in some ways, the heartbreak of my life. We started a company, myself and three other founders. So there are four co-founders total. I was the visible co-founder. We raised over $80 million at our company called bigwords.com. We delivered textbooks over the internet, cheaper than the bookstore. You know, we were going to take the fat out of that market and split it with the customer, you know, and it was really a brilliant idea. It really was. It was what the internet's good at. And our investors told us grow as long as you're growing and growing market share. Don't worry about being profitable yet. You know, like don't be stupid, but don't worry about it. Grow As long as you're growing and growing your market share, we can always get you more money. Right? So we grew and grew market share. And then in 2000, the market changed and all of a sudden they were like, yeah, oh, we can't get you money anymore, you know? And we don't think that you're going to be profitable fast enough. So we're pulling the plug. And that was after we had raised over $80 million, had about 500 people working for us, had a very cutting edge warehouse. You know, I think we turned down our opportunity to be purchased by Amazon and whole other stupid move, but you know, we were young and dumb and wanted to do it ourselves. Right. We'll never make that mistake again. So on October 20th of 2000, they pulled the plug on us. And not long after that, I almost died of an autoimmune disease because I had been sleeping maybe four or five hours a night at most. I had been stressing to the gills. I'd been traveling all the time. You know, I mean, it was just go, 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 go. And I was dealing with this thing like it was a sprint for three years, you know, and it's not a sprint folks, <laughs> you know, it's a marathon and you might have to sprint at times to just get past the alligators, but it's not a, you know, you, it has to be somewhat sustainable. And then the shame and the guilt and the feeling so bad that we had failed and I'd let everybody down. You know, it's not like I did anything wrong, but I was just so ashamed and I didn't get that there would be something after that. You know what I mean? So I went in a corner and cried and licked my wounds and almost died of an autoimmune disease that was brought on by lack of sleep and stress. So I was just fundamentally overdoing it as an entrepreneur, thinking that I would be able to just pull some sort of success out of just destroying myself. And that just, if that's the price of succeeding, then it's not going to be success you know? No. And so that's why I'm so excited about what you do and what you bring to people. Because look, success, you can succeed and not destroy yourself. Yeah, I know that's possible. Yeah. You know, and that's what really amazes me that those of us who are so driven and we will invest in ourselves because we want to improve ourselves. So we'll invest in training and opportunities for our team. And we're constantly learning and trying to be better individuals. And at the same time, we will be the very first to lose out on sleep and we will skip workouts. We'll skip meals because something needs to be done and we're going to get it done. So while we invest all over the place, we neglect our greatest investment, which is our own well-being ourselves and making sure that we're able to perform at our, our best. And I wish I had a pill that I could just give an entrepreneur when they're in that state of mind that, you know, I can only work, I have to keep working. I can only sleep a few hours a night. There's so much to be done. I'm going to work through the weekends. I'm going to do this, going to do that. I'm going to, you know, neglect my family. Because our brain convinces us, it's in fight or flight mode, our brain convinces us that's the most logical thing to do. We just need to get through this rough period. And I've talked to so many entrepreneurs on the other side of that, and they say, I don't know what I was thinking. Like, that's not logical at all. 
Don, do you have any, you study this. Do you know what's going on with our brains when that's happening? Well, we've just been hijacked by like not our prefrontal cortex, right? We're not in our best state of mind. We're not in our best, using our best thinking capacity. We're in that fight or flight ancient mode, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. And I think most entrepreneurs fight, you know, and okay, look, that's fine. If you had to do that, maybe even for two weeks or a month, but set a boundary on that, because if that becomes the norm, we're living in fight or flight. We're dumping all kinds of horrible long-term chemicals into our bodies and we're destroying ourselves. That game of how much sleep did you get last night? Oh, I only got four hours. Oh, I only got three. And then the person who got three wins, that's the dumbest game to win on earth. That is so dumb. Look at how bad the decisions people make are. It's like being drunk when you're not like, I don't think most people listening would drink a six pack every day and think they were going to be at their best, right? And make the best decision. But it's like being drunk. When you don't get enough sleep, your decisions are that impaired. So, you know, not only is it non-functional long-term for good decision-making, it is also, if you're playing that game of I slept less than you did, you are killing yourself just a little bit more slowly than most, but you are killing yourself. That's coming directly out of your lifespan and your well-being. And it's not worth it, right? It's not. And, you know, the thing about the decision-making and the impairment in decision-making is when we are in that fight or flight mode, like I got to get it done, I gotta, just got to move. We are making impaired decisions. And a lot of those decisions are made impulsively without enough information. And so if we could just you know, chill out, like just go relax. Today's Friday, go enjoy your weekend and then come back and deal with something on Monday. You're going to have a fresh perspective. We always, every time we get a good night's sleep, we all say, oh, the world looks different. (laughs) You know that, right? As an entrepreneur, we have things that happen every single day that create stress and we just move from one thing to the next to the next. And so we may feel mentally resolved on things, but physiologically, we have to complete the stress cycle. And so one of the things that I've just been more aware of for myself since I wrote the book is coming home in the evening and doing something outside physical so that I can complete that stress cycle. And it's it has nothing to do with me thinking about whatever issue was stressful that day or multiple issues, but it's just getting out there and physically releasing the stress and letting it go. It's hugely important because when you're running from the lion on the savanna, you're burning all that stuff up, right? And then you're safe and you're in the, and now it's over, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that that's one of the first things that goes for most entrepreneurs. You know, I would be admit that it's hard for me getting enough exercise. And if you've got that high stress level and you're not burning some of that off, that's building up, you know, and just not chemically healthy in the soup of your body to be doing that, you know? No, it's not. So I know there are things that you do in your life now that are very different than how you ran your life (laughs) at the time that you came down with that autoimmune disorder. And you still deal with lingering effects from it that you still have to be mindful of all these years later. So this isn't like it was a one-time event that you went through this really serious thing and survived. There's ongoing things. So what are you doing differently in your life now? So the biggest change is that I now guard my eight hours of sleep like my life depends on it because I realized it does. Yeah. And so You know, I mean, and I really don't have an option. If I get less than eight hours for a few nights, I start to have symptoms again and issues. And so, you know, I build in that buffer for myself when I fly and I go someplace to speak. I'm going to get there in time so that I can go to bed early enough that night, you know. And even though I might want to stay out till all hours with the, you know, having fun with everybody, you know. I go home so I can go to sleep and get enough sleep and get up the next day and be a hundred percent. Cause you know, that's the other thing is that when I'm working, you know, I, it's usually a bunch of people's time that I'm using up. I've got a bunch of people in the room or on the call and 
I need to be sharp. If I come in like dragging that, I'm, then I'm not doing my job, you know? Right. And so that's one big thing, guarding that eight hours of sleep, you know, and sometimes I get more. Like, luckily I have a five-year-old, so, you know, I'll, I'll fall asleep with him and <laughs> sleep for 10 hours sometimes. And I feel a lot better because of it. And I think I'm a lot sharper because of it. And I notice when I'm not. And then, you know, the other thing, that I'll say is that I really decided for myself, and I think it's kind of a universal truth, but it's certainly true for me. It's not success if it's not fulfilling. And working that hard and not getting enough sleep and not seeing my family and all that kind of stuff, that is not fulfilling, right? And so I started carving out an afternoon a week for my family and at first, we, I did it kind of pressed up to the weekends to try and extend the weekends. But then because of our, we were skiing and I was like, okay, well, Wednesday is a good day. It's in the middle of the week. There's not that much, like way more crowds on Monday and Friday. So we started taking Wednesday afternoons to go skiing. And what I realized is that's like a midweek weekend. That's what I call it, the midweek weekend, you know? So I work till noon on Wednesday knock off around noon and we just go have a blast on Wednesday afternoon. Now I've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning. I can do that. Right. Then I'm totally like, we have a great time all day. Wednesday, we're outside. We're not in the crowds and everything. And then I come back Thursday morning and I just have Thursday, Friday, right? Like today's Friday that we're doing this. And I'm like, woohoo, it's almost the weekend again, <laughs> you know? And it turned out to be a much better mental thing for me than I had any idea it would. So I'm now a big proponent of the midweek weekend. That's awesome. John, I really like the idea of this midweek weekend. And I think it gives us that break to clear our thinking so that we can be a lot more productive. One of the things that I used to do is try to cram everything into a four day week and take Mondays off. And so, right. That's what I was trying to do too. Yeah. But then I was doing these really long hours on Tuesday through Friday. And yeah, I was 10 hour days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're still doing a 40 hour week. And, you know, yeah. and then I would be exhausted on the weekends. It would take me all day Saturday to recover, you know, and then there was just a little bit of time on Sunday and then Monday. But so I really, I like this idea because we, you know, you have two days and you have a half day and then you just go and enjoy one of the things that you've shared with me that I think is so important is you've also put a lot more emphasis on your friendships. That was something that you said really suffered when you were working so hard. Oh, dude, I mean, for 20 plus years, I think that suffered. Yeah. You know, and especially Dr. Sabrina, for men, you know, I think, I mean, in the bell curve of life in, I guess, maybe Western societies or the United States in particular, probably were worse than a lot of other Western societies. I think women get socialized and taught how to form deep friendships and maintain those friendships better than guys do. And I think it's kind of an outgrowth of our biology and whatever, and our socialization, but guys do stuff in this shoulder to shoulder manner, right? We get together and we watch the game or we get together and we check something out or we go do something, right? We're not so good at like, hey, let's have a glass of wine and talk about our feelings, <laughs> you know? And guess what? We die 10 years earlier because of it. We have shorter lifespans because we do not have deeper friendships. And so about a year and something ago, I started to really commit to my male friendships. And you know what? I'll tell you the truth. I'm still super disappointed <laughs> at my results, you know? I've been reaching out. I've been sharing the articles. I've been trying to have us do fun things. Everybody jump on a Zoom call. But you know what? All my male friends prioritized almost everything else over their friendships, right? And look, I, I'm not making anybody wrong. Like family is important, right? I haven't been able to see my family enough. And, you know, all the other, like, I mean, but the one that does drive me kind of crazy is, oh, I'm working too much, right? I can't do that right now because I'm working. I'm like, I have a friend and only he will know who he is, but he just sold his company for like some ungodly sum 
he does not have to work anymore. Almost had a nervous breakdown about who he was and jumped back into being an, a workaholic. Wow. And he's one of the guys that I'm trying to get to go do stuff with me. And he's like, I can't, I'm too busy. Right. Dude, are you, t- what are you talk? Why did you do this? You know? And what I realized I didn't know and didn't understand and focus on earlier in my career is I'm not doing this for money. I'm doing this for freedom. Mm-hmm. It just so happens that money tends to allow for more freedom, right? So we get this, we get mixed up about what the real goal is. The real goal for me now, Sabrina, is freedom, man. I want to make a difference for the world. I want to make enough money that I can, and I want to get people around me so that I can hand this off. I want to go take a four week vacation. I didn't say all that to lead up to that. It just dawned on me as I was saying, right? Like that is what it's about. I want to go, I want to have more say over my life. I don't care if I make $20 $20 million if I have to be running 24 seven and I never, and I don't get enough sleep and I don't get to see my family and I don't get to do fun things. Like it's bankrupt to think I'm going to go fishing when I retire. I want to go fishing now. Yes, absolutely. You know, John, as you said that it dawned on me, it's so true that we go into this and we were looking for freedom. I became an entrepreneur because I didn't want to be tied down to a job and someone telling me what to do and how to spend my time. Right. And then very quickly, I thought it's going to come when I grow my business. I mean, that's what we all think, you know, somehow there's this magic revenue number. And when we hit it, oh, the, you know, the gates are going to part and you know we're, we're going to have freedom, but it never comes. And we get on this rat race. And one of the things that as I was putting together, I've been trying to put together the pieces of the tap the potential solution for years to figure out, you know, how do you build a business that is profitable, that doesn't require the owner to be there every single day. And it was magic when Mike McCallowitz shared profit first with me because that was a game changer. And it is step number one in the tap the potential solution to design your business to be sustainably profitable. But it got me out of that place where I felt like I just needed to get that next revenue level and get to that next revenue level so that I could have the money to enjoy some freedom. Right. And what you said is we've mixed up the goals. Like we've gotten things backwards. We think it's about the money, but it's not. It's really about what we want is the freedom. And the reason that's so hard to attain for, I think, so many of us as entrepreneurs is because we don't realize what the real goal is. And I think that's what you're talking about in the four-week vacation. And you know, because people hear that four week vacation and they think, oh, I'm going to go screw off for four weeks and then what? Right. No, 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 no. This is not about the four week vacation. Yes, it is. Right. But this is about the life and the systems and the business that you build that culminates in like the first culmination is this four week vacation. And then what else is possible? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's one of the things as I realized as I was writing the book, because I started this book years ago and I've had people reacting and get gotten feedback and people's first reaction was, well, I don't want to sit on the beach for four weeks and sip margaritas. That sounds really boring. I love what I do and I love my business. And what I want everyone to know is the four week vacation is not about a four week vacation. That's a great starting point. This is really about building a business that you take your life back from, like a business that gives you life, that gives your team life and the opportunity to thrive. And your friend is a wonderful example of what most of us experience when we take a four week vacation. (laughs) Who am I? (laughs) Who am I? And what the heck do I do with myself if my business doesn't need me and my team doesn't need me? I must have no worth in this world. I better get back in there and create a feeling of being needed. And that is a codependent relationship with our business. It's very unhealthy. And so if you have that feeling that I don't want to be away from my business because I don't know, it just brings up some sort of anxiety. Look around. If you have friends who are missing you, like John's missing his friend. That's a sign you're in an unhealthy relationship with your business. If your spouse is jealous of the business, 
you're in an unhealthy relationship with your business. That's the biggest sign. If your kids don't know you or they think you just show up at their events and you're on your phone all the time and you're missing all the important moments, you are in an unhealthy relationship with your business. And I talk about the book and say, you know, it's really my attempt to write my relationship with my business. One of the reasons it took me so long to write the book is I had to do all the work on myself. And that's what I see our clients going through who are in our Better Business, Better Life program as they work on getting their business into the right space where it's not about the revenue, it's about the profit. And it's mostly about creating more time for what matters most in our lives. Yes. And you know, like the other things that just go hand in hand with that are the things that I mentioned earlier, like the whole idea of fulfillment and good relationships. And, you know, I'm imagining my business in a couple of years and how proud I can be of the people that are doing a lot of the work because they love doing it and they help the whole organization make a much bigger difference. And I can take a four week vacation and come back and it's not like it's a disaster, like sales numbers have gone up. Like maybe I should leave more often, right? And how fulfilling that is to me to see people who love what they're doing all around me, just going for it because they want to, right? And we've together created this structure and framework of a business that supports our lives. Yes. And now how present are they with the clients and how much better are the solutions that they're bringing because they're showing up fully recharged and they've, they're, you love what they're doing and they love their lives. That's what I want to do. Absolutely. That's the most fulfilling thing. And, you know, when we have that as our vision, that we're moving in that direction, that becomes an opportunity for every choice that we make on a daily basis to align with that vision. And I think that's where a lot of us get lost is we don't have a clear vision. I'm amazed when I talk to business owners and I ask them, what's your three-year vision and what are you working towards? Yeah. And it's kind of like, what do you mean? I don't know. I want to grow the revenue. I know that feeling, right? Like I am awesome tactically, right? You give me a knife and parachute me in behind enemy lines and like, dude, you know, I'll just take out all the obstacles, right? But that's only a part of the solution, right? What about the strategic part of me that I've just been like, that gets real, like, you know, I'm not thinking strategically when I'm, you know, street fighting behind enemy lines in full on fight or flight mode 24 seven with my business, right? And it's one of the things that you and Sir Stephen have both, and you know, there are other people that I think that have encouraged me, but I think I've gotten the most encouragement from you and Sir Stephen and the most like psh, psh, to step back and think a little bit more strategically. You know, what I, I love what Stephen said, and I think it applies right here really well. He said, John, you know, you operate your business and you also own your business. So it is technically your biggest investment in life is your business. And yet you only act as an operator you never sit back and think like an investor in your own business. That's a problem. And I was like, holy crap. I was like, I need to sit back and think like an investor for a little while every month, you know? And the first thing I realized is I'm the biggest liability because if I'm not around, nothing gets delivered. So I need to, you know, start thinking more strategically about how I create a business instead of just a one man job. Absolutely. And that's what we overlook so often is how we are the greatest liabilities in our business. Because if our business depends on us and something happens to us, like COVID, for example, is the perfect. Even though my business, I've been through multiple four-week vacations, nine-week vacations, six-week vacations. You know, when I started thinking about, well, what happens if I get COVID? I thought, well, I think it'll be okay. But then I started thinking, well, what happens if multiple members of our team get COVID at the same time? 
that's not going to be good. And we've had businesses that we've coached who've been through that. And so we need to be thinking about this question of sustainability and how do we set our businesses up so that it's not dependent on any one individual or even small groups of individuals because that's a liability to the business. And, you know, when you talk about being thinking about the business from the per- investor viewpoint, I'm at, I invest. And if I knew that I was investing in someone who was sleeping four hours a night, skipping meals and, you know, working 80 hours a week, I'd be like, no, thank you. <laughs> that's not a good investment. They're not going to make good decisions. But that's what we do. But the other thing about thinking about the business as an investor is is so many of us think that our business somehow is a retirement plan. And there's going to come a point where we're going to have this business and we're going to sell it and we're going to have a lot of, get paid a lot of money and we're going to retire. But the reality is, is there's only a very, very small percentage of businesses that are sold number one, sold to even get sold. But number two, where the owner walks away feeling like, that was really good. I came out really good on that deal. <laughs> yeah, right. Because a lot of the buyers are private equity and they're just trying to like totally get the best deal they can and take advantage of everything that you've built. And if you don't build it like a really smart business, you're just never going to get the returns on that sale that I think we would all want. And that, that's one of my biggest revelations too. I'm like, okay, I got nothing to sell, you know? Like if I don't show up, right. there's nothing to sell here, you know? So I've started looking at my IP and I've started to try and codify my business and, you know, and that's hard because I've got, you know, one employee and we've been doing it just by the seat of our pants so long. It's really hard for us to start using things like Asana and start documenting what we're doing and make it easier to grow this thing and bring people on and on board. So, but you know, that doesn't mean we're not going to do it. Yeah. Well, I think so many who are listening to this can relate to that because, you know, when you start thinking about like Stacy on our team calls it the brain, there's a brain of tap the potential and it's not documented. Yeah. It's because, you know, we have people on our team who've been with us for four or five years yeah. and there's a lot that we've have documented, but there's a lot that's out there that's somewhere in the brain and we have to go find it. And when we bring someone new on our team, they're going to be like, what the heck, where is this? information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we all have to start somewhere. And it's those small steps forward in a consistent direction that lead to big change over time. And, you know, if we're going to take these small steps, let's be intentional in these small steps that we're taking. Yes. And there's a quote that I took from you and I should put it in the four week vacation and I want to share it. You said that visioning is about designing the future we're living into. And, you know, we don't take enough responsibility for really designing what we want to live into. When we just kind of show up and react to what's happening around us, we're really missing out on that opportunity to, you know, let's design something meaningful here that's going to have an impact. Yes. That quote is so powerful. How do you live that? Well, so, you know, this is something that I learned in an organization called Landmark. And I just want to call it out because it was one of the most powerful things I ever got anywhere. And, you know, when you say that quote, the other piece that goes right along with it is that not only are we not designing the future that we're living into, right? But our future is all full of stuff we put there by accident. Like, oh, my heart got broken. I'm never going to fall in love again. Or oh, I got the wrong answer when I raised my hand. I'm never going to do that again, right? So like we we have all this stuff stuck in our future, you know, and then we're not consciously pulling it out and putting something we want in there, you know? But, and Sabrina, this is something that I've actually been going through personally right now because that future is changing from, like I used to be just fine with like one man band. I'm just going to make money. I'll put some away and I'll be fine, right? I'm realizing number one, I'm probably not going to reach my goals quickly enough that way. And I have a five-year-old and I want to provide for him and I'm an older dad. So it's starting to get, it started to kind of grab me, you know? And so now when I catch myself thinking about the future I don't want, that's called worrying, right? The minute I notice I'm doing that, I flip it over to start thinking about what I do want, right? 
like, I know I have great content and I know that the organization that I have now and am creating can make a bigger and bigger difference. And I know that people get jazzed about being a part of that. And, you know, so I don't have it all worked out. I guess we never do. But when I notice that I'm putting what I don't want in my future, mentally called worrying, the minute I notice I flip it over and just start to imagine what I do want. And, you know, we've been having in our organization, we've been having meetings, talking about what we do want, looking at like, okay, let's say this worked. What would that look like? How many people would we need to support that? Do we think these revenue projections are reasonable, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's what I'm doing. And, and I feel like we both have a good friend named Sir Stephen, who's good at taking people through that visioning process. You know, I'm still getting the resistance out of the way, you know, so I'm taking steps and noticing that I've got this resistance, right? Because it's scary and it's not what I used to do and it's not how we used to do it. And oh, it puts me at bigger risk. And actually it doesn't put me at bigger risk, but it feels like it. And so, you know, there's all the stuff going on in my head. The monkey mind. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, John, one of the things that I want to just share about you is the work that you do is so powerful and it impacts so many people. And if you continue to play small and be your one man band, yeah. you really are depriving the world of your impact. And I say that to you. And I'm also saying it to all those entrepreneurs out there who listen to this and who think, I just want to be my one man band. I yeah. just, because I used to be there too. I mean, I went through several years of, are we going to grow tap the potential or are we going to just do Sabrina and do one-on-one -on -one coaching and that? That's really simple. And I realized if I do that, I'm just going to keep playing small. And, and that's one of the greatest gifts I've gotten from you, John, is to stop playing small. I mean, get out there in a big way and share with the world. And so as we start to wrap up today, you're doing these cohorts. I was a part of one. Yeah. Stacy's been in one. We have others. Steve Dale has been in one of your cohorts. And the work that you have done with myself and with, there's so many people in the Taft Potential family that I could point to and I say, wow, they're really shining these days. Look at what they've learned from John. And they're out there doing these things. You are doing some cohorts and your business is taking off. And so your opportunity to do these cohorts, the window is closing. So I want to share and let you share a little bit about what this opportunity is in case anyone wants to just get in there and take that opportunity. Well, thank you, Dr. Sabrina. And it's something that I'm going to keep doing as long as I can, because as you named off all those people, the fulfillment level of just any one of them and then all of them together, watching that being a part of that, like it's just one of the greatest things on earth to see people just step into an aspect of themselves that maybe they didn't even know was there before. Right. And share their stories and share themselves in a whole new way. So we're doing these cohorts and it's based around my core training, which I call the speak like a leader boot camp. So, you know, even if you already are a leader and you do speak like a leader, it's a great thing. And what we realized is that it's great as a self-paced course. We have that option, but there's just something to having a little bit of accountability, having some other people in the group with you, because that group coaching is actually in some ways more powerful than one on one. And then getting my decades plus of experience as well. So we run eight person cohorts. And it's a 10 week course. Sometimes we'll skip a week for holidays or whatever, but it's basically over 10 weeks. And in that experience, people, they choose, they craft, and then they tell their Ted like talk. And it doesn't matter if you're going to be on stage or not. You don't have to go give that talk at Ted. You could pieces of that talk. Well, then I think you've noticed will start to just be a part of your conversation. It'll be part of the podcast thing. It'll be part of talking to somebody who you're, you know, who maybe will be a partner or a client. It becomes part of all your conversations. And that TED-like talk, as we envision it, is made up of some key pieces like your origin story, which I think is your most important, most powerful asset as a leader, as anyone who's trying to be influential ever. 
So you get that, right? And then you'll get your one idea we're spreading, whether you do a TED-like talk or not, being clear on what really matters to you, that idea that you want to bring to the world, that it's unbelievable how clarifying that understanding is, right? And so, you know, this is one of those things where it takes something, but boy, does it provide back for the rest of your life. And I guess you could agree or disagree. I so agree because, you know, as I think about my origin story that I worked on and really honed in that in my cohort, I have used it at multiple times. And every time I share it, I refine it so it gets better. And there's so many things that we learn from you in that cohort that are so critical. So I mentioned I was live in person on the stage on Tuesday. I had an opportunity to speak for 15 minutes. It was a speed session. If anyone has ever, I mean, on the surface, it sounds great to do a speed session, right? But you have to be concise. You have to know what you're going to say and say it and move on. And that's what we learn from you. We learn how to curate and get the very best pieces and pull them into a story. And the other thing that I've learned from you and that I see so many speakers messing up on is to honor the listening in the room. So when I was on stage, there was anywhere from 70 to 100 in the room. That's a, you know, 70 to 100 minutes, 20 minutes of their lives that we need to honor. And so if we just get up there and wing it, like, oh, I threw my PowerPoint together the night before. I, you know, I talk about this all the time. I was talking about how to hire the best. I've been giving that speech for I don't know how long. Yeah. But I didn't wing it. I practiced, practiced, practiced so that I could honor the listener. And that's one of the things that you taught us. And you also taught us that every time you deliver it, deliver it like it's the first time because it's the first time they're hearing it. And <laughs> so, you know, if you want to show up powerfully, there's so many places where just being able to connect with your audience by sharing your audi your origin story will break through all kinds of barriers and immediately the people in the room will see you as a real human being and they want to listen to you after that. And that is something you will use over and over in your life. And so this is a huge opportunity, John, that you're offering. So where do, how do people find out more? Yeah. And you know, and I don't know, either the price will go up or we'll stop being able to do it if I get much busier, but we're committed to doing this for as long as we can and just the difference that it makes. So if people are interested, you know, we do have one starting on October 28th, 2021. And by the time most people hear that, it'll be too late. But the other thing that we've gotten requests for and that we're very happy to do is if someone really wants to do this and they can put together a cohort of between six and eight people, we'll run this privately for them, for businesses, for organizations, for just people who want to do this. And, you know, I think that might be how more of these start happening. And then I think right now we are committed to doing one that starts in 2022, just as a way to like start the year off right, make a commitment to yourself to be an excellent communicator, make a commitment to yourself to actually get out there and share yourself, be seen, be heard. So people go to Ed dot executive speaking success.com that's ed for education ed dot executive speaking success.com they can see the different offerings that we have live whenever they go there awesome that's fantastic thank you so much for sharing that john so i'm so glad you've been my guest again on the profit by design podcast and this time around that you really shared your story and your experience and i know that this is going to help some entrepreneurs out there make some different choices, choices about taking their lives back from their business. So I really appreciate you being willing to share in that way, John. Boy, I mean, if I could help one person with that, it would be worth it. And, you know, even more is gravy. But I will tell you, you know, I looked back on that experience a few years later and just thought, okay, you know, I will never do that again. I promise myself I will never do that again. And I spent time in meditation and in, you know, really purposeful thought about it, reassuring every part of my being that I would never be that awful to myself again. And, you know, I would just really encourage anybody who's hearing this and going, oh, you know, what do I, but I, you know, 
it's okay. Take a deep breath. I know how you feel. Baby steps, right? Even stopping the rat race can be done in baby steps, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Just stop sprinting in baby steps. Just go into bed at a normal time. I mean, that can be the baby step. Or the baby step can be that you take you turn your phone off at five o'clock and you don't look at it again until the next day. It's the little steps, it is that good. And one of the things, one of my learnings over the last year has been, I don't need a four-week vacation to recharge. If I can get really good at giving myself permission to put my phone down at, I do it at three o'clock and just be done. I'm done. And then I feel so much better and refreshed the next day because this really is, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to invite all the entrepreneurs, if you're listening to this, go to fourweekvacation.com. We have a very cool video on that web page about taking your life back. If you need any more inspiration than what you got here <laughs> to take your life back, go check out that video. John's in it, fourweekvacation.com. There's also a link there to purchase a copy of the book. Be sure to let us know when you purchase a copy of the book. There's steps and directions of how you let us know because you also will get an invitation to live training that I'm doing on how to implement the four-week vacation in your life. So, John, thank you again Super awesome. for being with us. And I want to encourage everyone, you can take your life back from your business. Thank you for spending time with us today. Join our conversation in the Entrepreneurs Take Your Life Back Facebook community at tapthepotential.com forward slash group. Share your aha moments from today's episode, ask me questions, and join in on the fun with your fellow entrepreneurs on the journey to designing sustainably profitable businesses that give you more time for what matters most and more money in your bank account than ever. And finally, share today's episode with a friend if you know a friend who would enjoy it. This is real life business. Keep your chin up, keep moving forward. You got this. If you're loving the Profit by Design podcast and have gotten any value out of it for your business or your life, would you mind doing two things? Subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and please leave us a review. Our listener reviews help us get into the top 10 of all entrepreneurship podcasts so that more entrepreneurs like you discover us. Your review is critical in helping us make a difference for more entrepreneurs who are ready to take their life back.